Uh, I've got a couple extra scores here I'm going to hand out down this way for other people who would like to observe it. Um, when, when I'm performing some things, if, if you're familiar with reading music, it may uh, inform um, what you're observing, and, and if you're not, you, you can follow along, and a lot of things are pretty graphic, so you might be able to, to follow along with that. So as I begin, one of the things I want to discuss briefly, I want to, I could spend an entire hour just talking about the history of electronic music. In fact, that's even difficult to do. Some of our uh, uh, candidates for this new music tech position have proven they're giving these elaborate um, dis discussions over in the music department. So I'm going to give as brief a historical overview as possible, making sort of the, the context of what I do and where I am now important. But technology and music have always been intertwined. In fact, the, the technology itself has helped shape aesthetic. The harpsichord, which was the primary keyboard instrument in the Baroque era, could only really play two dynamics. It would have two different manuals, and the mechanism itself would pluck a string. We're used to the piano where a hammer hits a string, but when you pluck a string, you don't have the same level of finesse. So you'd get one dynamic. And of course, there was a little bit of range with how hard you could press down. You might be able to over, if you push too hard, it would get really tinny and have some bad sound effects. So the harpsichord would have one loud that would pluck two strings and one manual that was soft that would pluck one string. So you had this idea of terrace dynamics, and that's a term that historians have applied after the fact. But you, you can only play loud or you can play soft. So the wind instruments playing with this accompanimental instrument had limitations with what you could do dynamically. When technology evolved such that we were able to bend wood and mold metal strong enough to withhold much greater tension, the piano was invented. And the piano refined some of what the harpsichord couldn't do in the fact that you had felt hammers that would hit strings, creating a range of dynamics being much bigger. So the music that was written in the Romantic era would take that technical advancement and use it to its advantage to define some of its aesthetic. Mozart's clarinet concerto was written for a basset clarinet in A, which is not the modern clarinet. In fact, its range doesn't actually fit the modern clarinet. So it's been adapted, and this is one of the definitive clarinet pieces, but we've had to modify it some to meet modern instrumentation and modern acoustical properties. So as a result, um, you, you get sort of this shifting of technology driving some of the, the musical decisions. Another important person, especially if I'm talking about the saxophone, would be um, Adolf Sax. Adolf Sax was a inventor, um, but primarily a music instrument maker. Came from a family of music instrument makers, and he most famously, obviously, from the name, he made the saxophone, but that was not his only instrument. In fact, uh, he was so into innovation. Here, I was recently in New York, and they had a big feature at the, um, the Met Museum with uh, this Adolf Sachs instruments. And this is one I found particularly interesting just to show you his engineering mind. This is a cornet trump, and it was designed to be held on the side of your body and wrap around you more fittingly so you could carry the instrument easily while riding horseback. Now, the reason that's important is that the horn is really affiliated with hunt and hunting, especially ceremonially. Um, kings would go on the hunt with their, their foxes and, or the, they, they fox hunting, I forget what it is, but the, they would play the horn and the horn would sound and, and that would be the signal that the hunt has begun or that the hunt has ended. So this was a, an, an adaptation of a well-known instrument but recurved in a way to fit the human body. Um, it didn't catch on obviously, which is why you don't see this very often. Uh, and we don't hunt like that anymore either, we sit in tree stands, so it's adapted slightly. This is a valved trombone. We're used to seeing slide trombones. This is one with not just one series of valves, but two. So acoustically, you've got more options. He was inventing and creating these whole new systems. They didn't catch on and necessarily take over the orchestral we uh, world the way that other instruments have, but he was really into um, tr constantly finding better ways to do things. The saxophone and the bass clarinet, if you notice the bass clarinet has the same shape as the saxophone, that's because Adolf Sax added those metallic parts to the instrument to help it project more. So he was innovating in a lot of ways. Recording technology really changed the landscape of music and music performance. The fact that we could record changes sometimes even the goals of what we're doing. You think visual art, right around the time the photograph came out, well, portraits were no longer the dominant form. We weren't painting to try and be as realistic as possible. Why do what a photograph can do better? The technological field shaped the aesthetic to where you get the, the movement of impressionism that comes after the photograph, where 
let's try and give the impressions of something, but take things out of focus. Let's do the opposite of what a camera can do well. So you're getting these technological advancements that are causing driving forms in artistic and, and aesthetic endeavors. So electronic music, uh, let's start by defining what it is. Technically, anything that is played through a speaker is electronic music. When sound is made and it goes into a microphone, a uh, membrane converts that acoustic energy, that, that energy in space, into an electrical signal. And an electrical signal usually needs amplification of some kind. And then is pumped out through speakers, as you'll hear later today coming through these speakers. Uh, and that's technically electronic music. Now, we have this, there are many different ideas of electronic dance music, EDM, all these different meanings that electronic music can entail, but it's a very broad term, meaning anything that involves an electrical signal to produce sound, and we'll start with that. Um, there, there's a lot of this re-emergence of this interest in uh, vinyl, and vinyl is recorded with analog technology. Analog is where um, everything's conti continuous, so you're recording with tape, the tape is running, and the sound waves are being converted into electrical signals, which are then writing onto magnetic tape what, what's going on, and then that's undone into speakers to get that sound back out. Now, digital is a, a sampling. It's where you take um, a bunch of frames, almost like a video camera. You're taking frames, and you're running them fast together, and you're getting this smearing effect where you get the, um, the sound as a result of that. And a lot of purists will say it's not as the same. It's not the, it doesn't give you the same sound, but really I don't find that to be a legitimate argument because with a human perception smear factor is about 28 events per second where we can discern single events from uh, one thing become, becoming a moving part and we're talking about recording at 44,000 hertz so if you can really tell a difference I don't really buy it and, and a lot of the new records are being recorded digitally and then put onto records so it's not really analog recording anyway it's just wanting to do it in vinyl which um, I find kind of funny and, and, and somewhat um, uh, uh, ingenuous or disingenuous when you want to claim that that's why you want vinyl is because of the unique sound that is really still digital. <laughs> it's just more for the, the fact of having a record, which I still enjoy. I just got a record player in my office for, for some saxophone recordings. Um, but it's, it's more of a kitsch, I think. So with recording technology becoming more prevalent and most importantly more portable, as, as things became portable, we could tar start changing the context of things we're listening to. I could go out into the environment with a recording device, record sounds, and then I can use those out of context to create audio imagery or to create some kind of idea or piece those together in new ways that change the context of what you're listening to. And this is really uh, aesthetically driven by some of the artistic movements of Dada, where you have Marcel Duchamp, who um, his famous fountain, which was a urinal turned upside down and signed and put on a pedestal, changes the context. You're looking at a device in a completely new way, and there are a lot of critics to this art form. A lot of people that say, that's not art, and it bring up, brings up the whole question of what is art, and what exactly are we trying to do with this? And it is, it, it, John Cage ties to this very heavily. He's the musical side of this. And what John Cage did is he would he completely changed the concert experience. Um, is anyone familiar with John Cage's four minutes, 33 seconds, perhaps? Maybe a music appreciation course at some point in your undergrad. This was a piece where the performer would walk on stage, go to play, and sit silently for four minutes and 33 seconds. And what happens is, a lot, at first, people are reactive negatively to this. Like, oh, there's no skill, there's no art in that. But the point of it wasn't skill or virtuosity or showing off, look how good I am. It was to turn your ears to the environment around you and start listening to what's going on at this moment. What sounds do I hear? And if you can turn your ears to what you're hearing now in a different context, that's music. Music is from the, the, the eye of the beholder or the ear of the beholder. If you're listening to something in a mu musical way, it becomes music. And this was a radical shift for, um, for aesthetics and for art that we could be approaching things in this, this manner. So as a result, post-World War II, the wartime technological advancements in sound recording and sound transmission that were designed for wartime communication, we had all this new technology and no need necessarily to use it for secret, covert operations. A lot of the leftover technology were sitting in radio stations and, and people were started toying with some of these things that you can do. 
And one interesting thing that I had no idea about, but we we funded the the, the Office of Military Government, United States and Germany, was involved in funding new artistic endeavors post-World War II in an attempt to change um, and drive what German pride was. Because the sort of idea of Aryan supremacy was tied by Hitler to music of Beethoven, music of Strauss, music of Wagner. This is the best. Nothing is this good. We do this better than anyone. So obviously there's um, some propaganda tied into that. Well, we played on the other side of trying to completely change their culture for our own propaganda of redefining what what art was. And the Office of Military Government funded concerts, funded research, funded a whole new avenue of exploration. One of those things being um, a studio in Cologne that we'll get to in just a moment. One of the first examples of what I'm talking about, this manipulation of sounds, is if, um, imagine you made a recording and you've got this musical tape that you've recorded and you've got all this sound that you've got there. Now that sound is kind of like a collage. You have all these different sounds that could be at your disposal, but it's linear. So you want to mix that up and make something new with it. So the Pierre Schaeffer was one of the first to take this idea of chopping up the tape, rearranging it, and then re-recording it, and coming up with his own almost musical compositions with just using these recorded sounds. And one of his great studies was the uh, the Etude al Chemin de Fer, his train study. And this is uh, it's interesting because you you take these sounds out of context and you realize, huh man, the trains are really rhythmic. There's kind of a meter to this. There's a pulse, and, and oh, there's the pitch of the train whistle that has kind of this um, harmonic context to it. So you, you can find a whole new aesthetic. So let's listen to this for just a moment. interesting about that is you start to hear that this sort of idea of musical meter like one of those trains was kind of a 5-8 feel to it and has like oh when you listen to it in this musical way sounds all around us can be interpreted through that lens of musicality what happens next and this is the the cologne so that was in Paris what was going on in Paris post World War II um, Karl Heinz Stockhausen is a very famous name in the contemporary music world, um, and he was known as being one of the serialists. And what serialism is, is it's an evolution of twelve-tone music, where the, which is interesting, because it has really socialistic um, musical implications. A after tonality reached its peak of prominence at the end of the nineteenth <laughs> century, there was this breaking of tradition, and. Uh, um, Berg, Schoenberg, and Webern are three famous people. Schoenberg was the first to sort of take, okay, we have 12 pitches that we work with musically. Instead of having one that always is that home note, we're gonna turn it into every one. Every one of these pitches is just equally as important as the other. And the only way you can do that is you have to um, wipe out the ways that we hear tonally. So they were redefining what music could be and the way that we could organize these musical sound systems. So this drastically shifted uh, artistically a lot, and there was a lot of resistance to this, as you might imagine, but it's a very commonly accepted art practice now, that you have to come up with new, um, new frameworks, new ways that we organize this. So the first was, we got all 12 pitches, let's make sure that we play each pitch before we come back to another one. And that's eight, or that's 12 tone music. 
Serialism says, okay, well, that's one parameter is just pitch. Another parameter could be dynamics or um, the way that we attack a note, the specific articulations. And you can serialize many different parameters to make the music multidimensional. So this is where serialism comes in. And this is one piece for um, percussion and electronics, which is one of the first interminglings of the sound worlds. A piece titled Contact. We'll listen to just a moment. things you'll notice in that particular um, musical example is that those sounds were more alien to our ears than the first one. The first one were field recordings. You took a recording device, recorded a train, chopped that up. That's music concrete, working with something tangible. This was actual synthesized sounds using electronic signals and modifying the actual electronic part to then put it into a speaker and see what the end result was. You're manipulating the actual electronic signal to get this new idea, and this idea is called synthesis. And that was what was going on in Germany. So these were developing at about the same time. Now, one of the, the things, the first time this really made the bridge into the US was in the Columbia Princeton Center. This was one of a few different centers where electronic music was being explored. RCA sponsored, there was a big uh, government grant to sponsor this creation of a synthesizer, and it, it took up an entire room. And it was a, a joint effort between Columbia and Princeton. And this particular computer, um, you'd program these sound cards, and you put the sound card in, it would make that would generate, based on the program you were writing, the sound you asked it to make. And it was one of the first of its kind to do this. Um, as a result, this created, it was Milton Babbitt's um, goal of being able to serialize without, as you can imagine, listening to some of this is complex music. Milton Babbitt was able to say, okay, well, humans tend to mess this up. I can do it with just a computer and actually do these great mathematical concepts and put them in and, and create fully serialized music that no performer can ever mess up. Well, he, he softened his stance a little bit on that and started creating these uh, integration pieces. So his first one of his compositions for synthesizer written on this technology is this example. We'll hear some of the sounds, and you're going to hear this being really just synthesized sound. It's, it's going to sound very... Uh, it's like electronic and, and almost alien to, to a modern ear. Work. <laughs> example you find there are sounds that still sound like an instrument that might be played and you're hearing snippets of things that, that might sound even familiar because a lot of this technology has been used in movies and electronic music since then in a more popularized fashion but this was the creation of it. this is where it was being uh, investigated and discovered and interestingly Milton Babbitt wrote a piece back in 1971 for 1970 71 John you might not be able to help John is one of my colleagues was it 71 when the machine was vandalized Okay, so he wrote it in 70. It was the year before the machine. It was the second to last piece. This Philomel was the, the last one he wrote. And this piece is titled Images for um, Saxophone and Tape. And since tape was the dominant recording method at the time, that was the um, what most things are written for. So you might write a piece for saxophone and piano. This is a piece for saxophone and tape. 
Now, modernly, modern technology, I'm not actually playing it with tape, I'm playing a digitized version of it, which um, is just adapting to modern technology. But this is Milton Babbitt's images. It's very serialized. You're going to hear, um, like I discussed before, the different pitches are presented before another one is made. It's very modernist music. This is not music designed for entertainment. It's music designed for exploration and artistic discovery. Um, so it, it, this may sound very different than some of the music you're used to hearing, but I'm going to give an example of this, and, and uh, I assume you have to slip up. John, is you're going to hear a piece of his here in a moment. We've been collaborating together. He's on the search committee. I want to thank him for stopping by um, and introduce him as, as the, the composer. You're going to hear some of his music in about 10 minutes. So thanks, John. This is Milton Babbitt's Images. I'm going to play about a minute, minute and 20 seconds of, of an example of the beginning of this. This was one of the pieces I learned for my first DMA recital at Bowling Green. Um, and the first person to ever record it was my teacher, John Sampson. Uh. It's just a snippet of the beginning. It's about um, a 10 minute piece that's fully serial. Um, it's quite challenging. If you notice, this was one of the ones in your score. Mm -hmm. And the score has four parts of electronic part, and then the saxophone line is at the very bottom. Um, so I'm reading, it's Babbitt's handwriting, it's never been redone. And part of that being the compl complications of some of his rhythmic writing, you'll notice he'll do mathematical concepts of subdivisions of three over five spaced over four beats. So you're really having to wrap your head rhythmically around some complicated uh, mathematical ideas here. Um, so that's Babbitt's images. And as we move forward, you're going to see some of the influences of uh, of what electronic music can do, especially with popular culture. One other piece I want to make sure I present, um, Mario Davidowski, what electronic music can do is it can take acoustic weaknesses of instruments and fix them or augment them. It can take what the sound of one instrument does and make it even better and more interesting. And what Davidowski does, he writes this piece for piano and tape. And one of the biggest weaknesses of the piano is that when you play a note, you can't crescendo that note. You can crescendo a phrase across things, but once you hit a single pitch, it can only decay. As a result, he used electronics to then sneak in the same frequencies and create the exact thing that a piano can't do on its own to make it an even bigger, better, more um, artistically creative instrument. Uh, and this is his synchronism number six. We'll listen to about, about 10 seconds of this one, 20 seconds. I want you to hear the interplay. from the beginning of that you can hear how things that can't come out of a piano were being augmented in but it still sounded like a piano he was using the harmonic spectrum of what a piano makes sound wise and augmenting that moving into the next decade that was all the 60s um, we get this idea of minimalism and 
what we more now know as post-minimalism. Minimalism was very minimal in its artistic endeavor, very simplistic. Um, what we call post-minimal is really repetitive. So taking simple ideas and looping them over and over, and you notice time and change on a grander scale as a result of this aesthetic. Um, this I'm going to play for you now a piece by Steve Reich, where you're taking uh, a simple idea, recording it, looping it, and then tweaking that idea. So then you're, you're interacting essentially with yourself or with a looped version of yourself and continuously modifying what that is. This piece, I'm gonna play about a three minute example, is for um, soprano, alto, and tenor saxophones. The original version is for uh, piccolo flute and alto flute. So it works really well with saxophone. A colleague of mine at Oakland University named Jeff Heisler wrote this version, did an arrangement, um, and he shared it with me so I can perform it for you. Give me a moment, because I have to make some quick switches. Get everything in place. Subotnik for the sake of sharing some of the new things. Um, but 
the, the, the realm of digitization and the fact that we can uh, communicate and, and use new programs and new software and any sort of processing that you could do with an a sort of external device, we can now write into computer code, drastically changes the game and creates so many more possibilities. Um, one interesting piece that I've been involved in the creation of, um, there was a composer named Claudio Gabriele that he's, he teaches in France, he's from Italy, or teaches in Italy, studied in France, but he's originally Italian. And Gabriele had written some pieces that I played one that was for tenor sax and fixed media. What well, fixed media means I'm playing with some fixed device. It doesn't interact with me, there's no change, it's a, it's a tape piece or um, a boombox piece as some composers have dubbed, or anything that's, you know, push play and it goes. Could be tape, could be CD, could be any, any sort of form of media, um, but it's fixed, it doesn't change. So you're limited some with how you can interact with that, because you're, you're designed to try and stay within what's going on on the track. Well, I reached out to this composer, I played one of his pieces I really liked, and said, Claudio, I love what you're doing, you've got great piece for tenor sax, would you write one for alto sax? And again, this a shot in the dark, you never know. Some composer's like, yeah, $10,000, and it's like, oh, okay, maybe maybe in 10 years when I write a grant or something. He, he went, sure, I'll have it to you in, uh, in six months. And I, no cost, no anything, and I was blown away. So as a result, he goes, just send me some sound files, the things you can do on the instrument, send me some various effects, and I'll work with that. So I got together with a recording engineer, recorded different sounds of pieces that I thought were idiomatic to my playing, and sent him that, and then I got this piece sent to me, and it's interesting, because our, all our communication was via Facebook. Never emailed anything, we sent the files via Facebook with Facebook Messenger, and it's interesting that that, um, that vehicle provided impetus for me to, to meet someone, or to find someone that existed in Italy, and create this new piece. Um, and it's a good relationship has fostered since then because he may be writing a saxophone concerto in, in the coming um, couple of years and hopefully I'll get to go to Italy and play it. We'll see. Um, but it, it was exciting that that became an opportunity. So I sent him these files. I'm going to play you some of Brooklyn. This is another one of the examples you have. It's a six page document, front and page three, or front and back three pages. But this is Brooklyn for alto sax and electronics. He went to New York, recorded some sounds of his own, and he mixed these with the sounds that I gave him, and then he wrote a saxophone part to accompany it. So you'll see that most of the pacing of all the information I'm given is just the timing of where the tape, and he didn't want things to necessarily line up tight, like the Reich. The Reich has to be super specific. Tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick -a. This one is very loose and free, and he wants you to have the ability to interact with the sounds you're hearing, and possibly even be a little bit different every time you play it. Which is why he didn't give me much information. I find about this piece that was really interesting is that I had no idea 
what he was going to do with the sounds I gave him. It was really free. I said, here are some sounds. And some of the ones that I recorded that you heard in there, um, actually the recording you just heard was recorded in, in our recital hall a couple summers ago. Um, I, I, I went and made um, a slap tongue is an effect that you can hear pretty frequently in the contemporary saxophone world. It's very percussive. It sounds like a drum. So I've made various different versions of that going from soft to loud, loud to soft, uh, some inverted versions of that, um, some because it creates a really interesting sound effect. Additionally, I gave him some helicopter-ish sounds. Kind of that flutter tongue effect, different things that I could create to create as many percussive techniques, and then he used that and, and created his own version of, oh, here's the material I have, here's the paint colors I've been given, let me create my own painting. So it was this really interesting collaborative work that got me really interested in continuing to explore even more what was possible with electronics. So at this time, really fixed media was the, the most I had dealt my, or, you know, stuck my toe in the water of electronic world, and I wanted to learn more. So I moved on, and I, I started working with composers who use this program, Max MSP. And what Max MSP is, is it's open source, it's a graphic interface program for live processing. So it's going from having something fixed to now, not only am, am I'm providing the musical material, the computer is doing something to it, spitting it back out, and then I'm able to interact with that to then feed it more. And the way that, depending on how the program is written, there's so many avenues for possibility. Um, what, what it's basically, imagine a, a table this size filled with guitar pedals. Now, traveling to a conference with that would be quite difficult. You have a, a computer, you can do it all in a single um, graphic interface. Let me show you what some of those look like. These are images that John sent me earlier um, that, let's see, welcome back to Xbox Connect. Here is the, one of the interfaces. You can see all of these different levels. Each line that you see is basically a cable connecting to another processing unit. And then you can double click each one of these units to open it up and give it its own set of parameters and close it back. So each one of these, this is the routing of what the signal's happening in real time based on what I'm feeding it. And we're able to create these huge soundscapes out of a single instrument and then being processed by uh, what a computer is capable of doing. Now, we took this a step further and one of the new interesting things is the Xbox Connect camera. Design, you know, you use it in video games, it has an infrared camera, it has a distance sensor based on using little dots it projects into space, and then it also has technology that can recognize your joints and recognize each part of your body, so it knows where your knees are. It's fascinating, but it started as military technology so that, you know, you could send a device into a room, you could know where everyone was at any given point, and, and you don't have to risk injury to invade a hot seat situation. So military technology, Xbox got, or yeah, Microsoft got a hold of it, developed it into this technology for video game, but they made it, it's a USB plug. So there have been programs now to where, plug it into your computer, now we have all this data that we can use in new ways. So John and many, many uh, contemporary composers are using this data to redefine the parameters of some kind of visual performance. So now, not only what, I, what I'm playing is feeding information, but how I'm moving, where I am in the room, there's now, I can control the electronics simply by being in a different place or a different spot with this camera. So what it does is it creates a whole new dimension to, of musicality. So here's one snippet of the patch. Here's another snippet. What you'll notice here in this particular section, that yellow dot is where I'm standing. The other circles are fields. And depending on where I'm standing, what field I'm standing in, tells the computer what to do with what I'm playing. So it gives it different instructions. So I can be playing, I can play a musical snippet, it's capturing that and processing it in some way. And then I can step back here, play a very different musical snippet. Now there's a page in your handouts that you can flip to, one of the, the next ones at the back, that actually you see the circles and the musical material that's assigned to each one of those circles and how the computer processes it differently. So I'm gonna to come to that in a moment. I just wanted to make the connection here while I have this, pre this slide up. Now this particular part of the patch the, the numbers in here on the graph are my joints. I know four is my hand, because I, I'll show you a video in a second. You can see this in action. But each one of these is, is graphing me in space. So depending on where I'm standing and how I'm moving, we get different effects and different manipulation of the sound. So the videos in this file didn't play nicely, so I'm going to have to escape from PowerPoint 
and pull them up in quick time. But let's start with start with this one. This is showing how the patch is interacting with space and my, my, my joints and my physical body. So here's me moving. Oh, it's a little glitchy, I apologize. Jump ahead. You can now see the numbers actually moving. And you can see how it's processing and connecting it over here to this different sound field. And that swarm effect you'll hear in a moment um, when I start messing around with we're, we're, the next video. I'm actually, this isn't a part of the piece. I'm just having fun because this is so much improvisation that you can do when this is your new avenue. So we're, he's t introducing me to the patch in this next one, and I am kind of going free with all these different effects and using some sounds that I've been introduced to in the past. just having some fun sort of seeing what happened to the sound. Now I use some of these effects in the music that John wrote. Let's see. Oh no, this is this is one more. I want to show one more section of, of the this is the demonstrating the camera and it's three different versions. There's a three-dimensional space representation, here's the actual camera, and then there's the infrared that shows me as white and the backspace as, as the black space. So it's, it's testing, it, you can determine what are bodies and what are not. It's interesting to me is that it actually connects it, the saxophone as an extension of my body. Because it's designed to, if you're playing a sports game, you're holding a bat, anything that moves with the body is also interpreted as a part of that. We just haven't figured out a way to make parts of the horn actually be like a joint of some kind. Because that'd be really cool if it recognized the neck of the instrument and I could cross a threshold or a plane. Um, but we're very much in the, the living, developing work of this. So. <laughs> processing a much lower frequency sound. So when I'm facing this direction, it's putting up in a much higher realm. So we're testing the parameters of how well is this doing this, how much is it, is it taking from what I'm doing and processing and chopping up and, and really messing around with the sound. So it, temporally, it's kind of interesting in the way that you can then um, layer on top of that. Now, the, the piece itself that we're writing and premiering in, um, in Texas next week at a NASA conference, NASA is the North American Saxophone Alliance, involves, let's see, the, these are two of the movements. One of the movement uh, is the piece you have in front of you, the delays. I'm going to open that one up. Um, you can see me moving a little bit on the one computer screen. You can see the actual patch, what we talked about earlier, the circles and how I move in and out of those spaces. And you can also see which musical material represents which one of those spaces and how it's being processed differently because the, the, each space does different things. One chops things up, one delays it over time, one actually augments it there on the spot. So here, are, here is one of the movements of John's new piece.
what's one of the movements or vignettes of this piece? And you can tell it's amazing the limited amount of information I was giving it and how much augmentation was happening. I mean, it almost sounded like an entire orchestra was behind me at times. There was the slap tongue effect that was then turned into this low driving beat, almost a percussive thing. Um, it's really interesting that just, I mean, with electronics alone in real time, we're creating all these sounds and it's all based on this the overlapping you know, digitization and, and ability to use code and data and, and uh, mega processors. So the last thing I want to listen to today is the really lyrical movement. Um, this is where it's mostly, um, I'm playing these kind of legato 16 note runs that are just really smooth and the program genre for this one is capturing, it's recognizing certain pitches that I play and then playing them for certain preset periods of time. So I'm sort of moving through this, this soundscape and it's, it's augmenting what I'm doing and it's kind of almost as if you're moving through liquid or in slow motion, this kind of feeling of swirling of sound all around you. Um, and this is one of the other vignettes and movements of, of the piece that we're premiering next week. So, and you can tell I'm wearing the same clothes. We recorded this this morning, so it's, it's very fresh, hot off the press. <laughs> tail end of the video, John was making adjustments as we were doing this. So it's not just me and a computer, but he's manipulating in real time based on what's happening and, and tweaking much like a sound person that a soundboard would um, soundboard would, would do, but he's working in, in the digital realm rather than twisting knobs and levers. He's at his laptop modifying things and I'm amazed at how quickly he'll find, oh, that's not working and just like type up a line of code and inject it in. But there, there's quite a learning curve to being able to figure out um, writing the software. Um, but it really opened the door for possibilities. Uh, and as a result, there's, there's a whole new artistic realm for exploration. And this is, you know, the beginning of, of uh, hopefully a long collaboration with John on some of these interesting endeavors and, and pushing forward with, with the technology and finding new possibilities as new programs are written, new patches are discovered, new techniques are written, but it's all through digital code that's making this really possible, the augmentation of the analog sound world. So. Um, I got a few minutes left for questions. I went a little closer to the 30 minute mark than I'd hoped, but I, I felt a lot of this needed to be gotten through. So I hope you enjoyed the playing and the lecture, and please let me know if you have any questions. So. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm assuming all of these things are used in uh, contemporary uh, music besides the sequencing and the timing. The Fixing the like the piano or the guitar and the instrument or adding sound effects or also movie sound effects. A lot of it sounded familiar, although you just from stuff I hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of it's used. Um, I mean, you, old Hitchcock films used the own Martin O as an electronic instrument. Uh, Beatles used the Moog synthesizer. Um, a lot of it's been used, especially in synthesizers became big in '80s music, um, as as we were discussing earlier. Um, down in the, I know we were discussing the Dina. Sorry, Dina. We were discussing earlier the the 80s music and the saxophone's connection there. Um, but the 
synthesizers have, have really been brought into the pop music world quite a bit, and a lot of these effects um, generally takes about 20 years before some of those effects make it really big in the mainstream, although that learning curve is quickly dwindling. There'll be something really avant-garde that the user discovered, and then two years later DJs are doing it in their new electronic dance thing. So a lot of this is being used in the commercial realm. It's being used in, that's the music business program, the music tech, pro tech program we have here are really interesting in crossing those worlds together and, and helping students um, explore some of these contemporary techniques into that new world. Did I answer your question? A lot of the, is that kind of what you're asking? You want to put on like the even modern rock music or something like that, they'd be adding these effects to make it more perfect. Mm -hmm. like you mentioned the piano string to fixing the instrument to do stuff that it can't naturally. Right. Or adding sound effects uh, yes. at the exact right time when it's done digitally. Especially in re recording technology. You'll find um, with recordings, they're constantly like auto-tune. There are elements of this, their auto-tune was used in that patch where it was used to recognize the pitches that I was presenting and then put them out. It wasn't necessarily tuning the notes I was giving, but all this technology that, that is in here is what is being used in uh, modern pop music in, in the studios. That's how they're getting a lot of these sounds. Um, but, but yeah, a lot of this technology is not uh, contained to the realm of contemporary art music, but it, it's it infiltrating music all across the spectrum. Awesome. Good question. Um, it, it seems like there's a real focus on the mechanics of the music, the composition, the sort of the, the um, kind of like, if you're looking at literature, there's this movement in the 80s of language poetry, where poets said, meaning is irrelevant. It's all about language and construction and composition. Mm -hmm. um, and meaning is secondary to that. So I'm kind of wondering if, if, if you feel like this music focuses so much on composition mechanics of the music that what does it do for you as a player to the emotional content or to the, the ability to generate emotion meaning um, it's interesting because I think that's different for each listener mm -hmm. um, I'm not worried about generating meaning per se um, the the technical side I mean when you think about science and, and moving forward no one makes a rocket to make you feel better Right or to you know, there's no emotional context. It's right. we're experimenting with something. Let's see what happens. And a lot of times, meaning and emotion is attributed after the fact, and it's all based on personal experience. Two people could hear the exact same piece of music and walk away with very different meanings based on what they brought to the table. Um, I, I tell my students it's really important that you have an idea you're trying to present because people can tell if there's an idea behind it. They're not necessarily going to perceive the same idea. But there can be some communication between two people through this sound world that may, based on your what you bring to the table as an audience member, is going to have its own um, its own frame and context, and, and it's difficult to predict that or to intentionally make that happen. In the Baroque era, it was all about this piece is sad, let's make it sound sad. This piece is melancholy, that's different than sad. This piece is happy. This piece is a dance, and it, it was all about individual moods and. It, the doctrine of affections is what we call that now. Each piece had to have one affect, and that was it. Contemporary music isn't really that. A lot of it's experimental. It's trying new things out. And, 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 so, and a lot of times, especially living in the, the present with brand new compositions, you have to have freedom to be willing to fail with it. Because some, you know you might SpaceX might shoot up a rocket and it not work. Well, it brings you to the next thing. It brings you to the next idea that will work in the next masterpiece. Um, so we know the master works from the 1700s and 1800s. We don't know the master work from this decade yet, but you've got to be creating and, and experimenting. So to answer your question, it's not something I worry about or give thought to. I just focus on creating new art with the hope that I'll leave something behind that's deemed great at some point down the road. But that's not even true. I don't really worry about whether it's deemed great. I just want to push things forward and see where it goes. Uh, I don't feel that weight of history on my shoulders that that I think composers did at the turn of the 20th century. But I don't know if that answered your question. Philosophically, we could discuss this for an hour and a half. Um, it would be really easy to talk about all these different things. Um, and there, there are a lot of different movements. And I, I can tell you many times I've been at a coffee shop or at a conference out at the, uh, the you know, hotel bar the night after chatting with composers about these real ideas. And they're ideas that we spin with and live with constantly. And it's one of the, I guess, the artistic struggle is, you know, what, what's the meaning behind this? Does it have meaning? And, and so much of that's subjective. It's really hard to put in an academic context. So I, I don't try to academically. I, 
I just try to focus on the mechanics, like you said, and, and what's going on here um, in, in the actual moments of it, to what's going on with the, the technology. And then, you know, sometimes the aesthetic will transfer into that having some meaning for the listener. Did that answer your question? Just related to the technology, mm -hmm. I saw recently a demonstration of these, like, it was used for techno music with these, these gloves and hats for fine movements put on a different beat. Is that, is that the same idea without using the 3D sensors, but to actually put on a device that uh, senses the computer to load different beats? Exactly. It's the same, some of the same technology. Um, those actual pieces are different, I mean, you couldn't play saxophone with gloves on, so it wouldn't be something we could use, but of DJs, there's, there's this new baton that's been created, to, and actually, with the Mort Subodnik that I skipped over, um, In Two Worlds was a piece for a saxophone concerto written for saxophone and Ely, the electronic wind instrument, and then orchestra and electronic orchestra, so a computer, and then the conductor had both a baton and this new electronic baton technology that would interact with the computer to tell it what to do. So it was this sort of crossing between the two worlds, which is why it was titled In Two Worlds, um, of both uh, electronic production of sound and, and acoustic production of sound that, that created that, the impetus for that artwork. But that was back in 91. So the technology has come a long way. It was written in 86. 91 was one of the versions of it. Um, but we've come quite a ways with digital technology since 1991. And there are all kinds of new th Every time I go to a conference, there's some new thing that is being used to manipulate sound and space and real time and these fields and, and all these different sensors so that what you're talking about is, is the same technology. I'm just not familiar specifically with the, the apparatus you're using. Electrically, you could have done the same thing with three pedals. Exactly. As opposed to the movement. You could do the same thing. Well, I don't know if you could do the same thing with three pedals because the, the fields that I was in were um, if I was in the center, it was taking more than us if I was in an extremity. So it was actually, there were different parameters within that that you couldn't get sensitive-wise with a pedal. I guess you might be able to do with a pedal, um, but you wouldn't get the left-right body motion and you wouldn't get, um, you, you could theoretically make one pedal for each individual code thing that we're writing, but you could see how that could get really complex when you just look at the patch to have to manipulate all these variables in real time while trying to play. Um, but theoretically, every component could be programmed into one single module. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the great question. Thank you. Thank you.